Hey everybody, it's Lon Seibin. We are back at the Kennedy Space Center for another launch attempt of Artemis 1. This is an uncrewed mission to the moon and on the top of the enormous SLS rocket about three miles away from me there is the Orion spacecraft that's going to spend almost three weeks just over three weeks actually in space at the moon it will then come back and NASA will begin looking at the data to figure out what they need to configure both on the spacecraft but also on the people before a crewed mission to the moon coming up in a year or so on the Artemis 2 mission. As you can see, we are right now about 10 hours and 49 minutes away from launch. The launch will be a night launch at 1 a.m. today. Uh, so it's going to be a very long night for me here, but I thought I would take you behind the scenes in this video and show you what it looks like to be here on the ground when one of these rockets goes off. You can, of course, see some great footage from NASA and all the other press that are assembled here uh, on their channels, but I thought it might be fun just to get a feel for what it's like to be here as close as you can get to one of these rockets before they lift off, and that's what I'm gonna shoot for uh, this evening if there is indeed a launch. So here is my lowly camera, and the rocket is probably not visible in my GoPro footage here, but here's a look at what my camera sees. So we've got a really good view from over here, and this will be a night launch, of course, but it will be nicely illuminated there, so we should get a nice shot of it lifting off the pad, and we'll be able to see it uh, going into space because it will be dark out, and that rocket will be exceptionally bright. And I want to thank our travel sponsor, Avello Airlines, for their help in getting down here for this mission. They covered our first flight down, but I've since been a paying customer on the past two uh, because this has been a mission with many scrubs so far. Avello is an excellent airline. They usually get me into my destination on time or earlier. In fact, most of the time I've been getting in 20 minutes early, which has been great. They're very affordable, great customer service. It's an airline that I actually look forward to visiting uh, when I travel. And they're uh, coming out of small airports and delivering people to larger ones. So in my area, New Haven, Connecticut is where I fly out of. It's a great little airport. It's so quick and easy to get in, get through security, and get on the plane. It's something that uh, I am very grateful is now in my area, and I hope you all will check them out. They may not be at your airport now, but they might be in the future. So head over to lon.tv slash Avello and sign up for their Instagram page. They often put up sales and giveaways quite frequently on there. And then you can also visit their website, which is linked down below in the video description so you can see uh, some of the other options that they offer. But definitely check them out, and I really appreciate their support of the channel. Now behind me is the Vehicle Assembly Building, or VAB. Back when the shuttles were flying, that was where they stacked the shuttles. They are now stacking the SLS rocket in there, and it comes out vertically on an enormous crawler that takes it out to the pad. But just to give you a sense of scale here, the shuttle used about three doors on that vehicle assembly building to exit to go out to the pad. The SLS uses all of them. It is that much taller. Now we'll be watching the launch from the NASA press site, and this is where the press has been gathering for decades now to see these missions launched. And of course, you have that iconic clock and flag there. Now over here is NASA TV's set, and they erect this every time there's a launch. Looks pretty nice here. They are on satellite, on cable, and of course on the internet at NASA TV. Let me walk you over here and we'll take a look at some other things. Now there are permanent structures here. Let me get past this air conditioner. Uh, there are permanent structures here that some of the news organizations operate. So I think the uh, one that is directly in the center is NBC and CBS News is over there. And then of course NASA has their news center here. This is not only where you can talk with representatives from NASA and some of the contractors working on this mission, but it's also our sheltering location should something go wrong. It's unlikely that'll happen. They're being very careful about uh, launching this rocket until they're completely certain it's ready to go. But there are chemicals that are pretty dangerous inside of the spacecraft. And if there's an explosion, their concern is that those chemicals would get into the air. So our uh, sheltering location will be here. And we have about five minutes to run into that building and wait for the all clear. Now the Kennedy Space Center is a nature preserve. And if you look closely enough, you will see some wildlife interacting uh, with the rockets here. This little turtle I encountered as I was walking back to my tripod. And they also have plenty of alligators, birds, and other creatures that live alongside these rockets that are launching into space. Now the countdown clock behind me is relatively new. This was put in a couple of years ago. They built it on the base of the original clock that was here since the Apollo days. But this one, of course, now can do full motion video. 
and all sorts of crazy stuff. And then of course you have the flagpole here and this flagpole and clock location are in the National uh, Historic Registry for historic places here in the United States. Now, what's really intriguing to me is what's going on at these launch pads behind the clock. So, of course, we have the massive SLS rocket on pad 39B. That pad was built to the uh, specifications of the Saturn V rocket initially, but the space shuttles also launched there. And another pad they were using for both Apollo and shuttle is 39A. And there is where SpaceX is erecting an enormous tower for their Starship mission. And what's most intriguing, I think, about this upcoming moon landing attempt is that the lander is built by SpaceX. It is a SpaceX Starship. And in order to get that lander to the moon, they have to fuel it in orbit with other Starships. So NASA has really bet on SpaceX here to get them onto the surface of the moon. And it's quite a contrast to see this commercial startup operating and building something right next to the tried and true uh, traditional government contract kind of rocket. And I think that's gonna be a story that will be talked about a lot, not so much on this mission, but when we get to the landers and the cost differences between the two programs. Now, a couple of weeks ago on one of our prior trips here to the Space Center, we interviewed Shannon Walker to talk about this mission and how it's different from the prior ones. Have a listen. It is different because we've got different goals that we're doing now because we do want to go to the moon and we want to stay there and we want to do more science than we did uh, before. So the Apollo was, is, was the preparatory steps for what we are trying to accomplish now. There's a lot, there's a lot yes to go to. That's why this, this mission here is a test mission. So we've got to make sure that the rocket's ready to go, that the Orion spacecraft is ready to go. Uh, we've got to make sure that we've got the new spacesuits to walk around on the moon. So those are still in development. Um, we've got to get our landers. So there's, there's a fair bit of stuff left to do before we actually put boots on the moon. And what can we expect over the next couple of years? This is going to be a pretty quick cadence. We're going to be testing a lot. So what, what's, what's next after this one? So after this one, we're going to get the Orion spacecraft back and we're going to pour over all the data to see you know, what worked, what didn't work, do we need to tweak anything, and, and we're already building the, uh, the next rocket. Um, we got rocket parts all over here getting ready to be built up uh, to get ready for the next launch. Now we also had the opportunity to talk to Thomas Zerbikin, who's the head of the NASA Science Directorate. He told us about some of the science objectives of this mission, along with some of the future ones. For me, some of the most exciting science relates to uh, both exploring the moon. We have two uh, missions that are mapping the moon for water and other kind of uh, resources that are there. We all have radiation experiments looking at biology. And then we have some technology demonstrations as well. So together, uh, these uh, 10 or so investigations really advance science and take every opportunity of the Artemis One mission. So from the beginning, the Artemis mission has been a combination of science and human exploration. And the farther we get into the Artemis program, that lever is shifting to the right, right? Right now, it's about testing out the engineering systems, but we're not missing any opportunities to put science on. It's just so exciting to bring uh, humans to the surface of the moon and really address science, that, the likes of which we, frankly, I have no recollection, like, together with most people, most humans alive today have no recollection off of ever us doing this. We're going back to a moon that has a lot more exciting signs and questions that are open for us that, uh, than we had when we left it uh, in 72 after the Apollo program. So it's about volatiles. It's about that water cycle on the moon. It's about the chronology of the solar system. It's about processes that are there. And you also using the moon as a platform perhaps for astrophysical observation. So, so there's a lot of ideas and the best ideas probably we haven't thought of yet. All right, we are in the final countdown here. We have about three minutes left to go. And what we're gonna do today is have a commentary free launch so you can hear exactly what it sounds like. And I'll let you listen to the sounds of the launch. <laughs>
plus haut et rempli de, de 1000 tonnes de carburant explosif. I gotta tell you, that was pretty intense. I've been to a bunch of rocket launches over the past couple of years, but this one was by far the most spectacular. That is one big rocket, and I could feel my clothes shaking and the ground shaking and everything around me lit up like a mini sun was taking off. It was intense. I let out a little wow as it was going up, and I was trying not to do any commentary so you could really get a sense as to what it sounds like at one of these launches. It is sometimes terrifying to watch these rockets go up because of the amount of power that's unleashed and no video could really do justice to the brightness of these things as they go up. It almost hurts to look at them. And so it's important, I think, if you ever get a chance to see one of these to just take it in. And that's what I kind of did today was to take it in so I could experience it and tell you what it was all about. Now, in a couple of hours, we're going to go out to the launch pad with some photographers that place their cameras very close to the pad. You're allowed to do that here if you have press credentials. And of course, your camera has to operate completely autonomously. And they have all sorts of different ways that they trigger their cameras to go off. So we'll probably be getting out there in a couple of hours, maybe get a couple hours of sleep here. But this was awesome to finally see this through. I am so excited to have been able to experience this and bring it to all of you. And we've got a little more left here. So let's head out to the pad and see how those cameras did. So we are out here with the photographers now picking up their gear. And this is the crawler way that takes the rocket up to the pad. And you can see just how large these uh, the stone area is this is just one track of that enormous crawler and what it does is it brings the mobile launching platform up that hill into the launch position and it's hard to tell from here but it looks like the mobile launcher did take some damage last night and it looks like they're not letting us get any closer today uh, because of the potential safety hazards there you can see what the photographers have set up here every one of them has a different strategy for setting up these automatic camera rigs here some put them in bags others have boxes and what they're hoping for is a good shot from last night Last night was really challenging because it was very humid and the uh, dew point was such that it really was fogging up everyone's lenses. Our tripod legs were sweating. It was pretty crazy here, but everyone's working pretty quickly because they uh, need to keep operating here and uh, get that pad secured. So I'm here with my friend Jeff Seibert and he's got a uh, really cool rig here. I love visiting with you because uh, you always have the best ideas here. So what, what do we got in here? A little GoPro 4 with a timer on it and a self-charging system and batteries. And and you need something to kind of keep the lens warm also? You have a little bit of a warmer in no, there? It warms itself. It, these GoPros run pretty hot. Yeah, I found that out last night with, uh, with my GoPro. It was extremely hot, so it didn't fog over. So. And then this one even has a fan in it. So it's like you have to have, have cooling provided. So yeah, they're fun. It is a lot of fun. How long have you been doing this for? Uh, 12 years, I think. This is my 251st launch. Wow, and you get better every time, right? Nah, I don't get better every time. <laughs> the equipment's starting to wear out, and I have to keep replacing stuff to, to kind of improve it a little bit. What I love about what happens out here is that everyone does their own thing and has yes. their own strategy. All, all the boxes are different, the tripods are different, the cameras are different, the ideas are different. It's really cool. And we all get something sometimes. That's right. <laughs> it's like fishing. Well, we got to get back on the bus before we get in trouble. Yeah, you got that right. So that is going to do it for this coverage of the Artemis 1 mission. It was definitely an arduous task to cover this because we did have to come down a couple of times until we were able to get that rocket off the ground. And last night there was some drama in that they had another leaky valve that they had to deal with. And they actually went out to the pad and fixed it with the rocket fully fueled, which is very hazardous. But the team that went out, they called the red team, uh, got out there and got everything tightened up and it was ready to go after that. But once they got that leak resolved, they had a bad ethernet switch, if you can believe that, on the radar system that the Space Force uses to monitor rocket launches for safety. And that was what held up the launch a little bit last night, but they got that switch replaced and off it went. So we're going to come back and do more here at NASA. I've done some other videos in the past, including a part one to this dispatch where we talk to scientists and astronauts and engineers about everything that goes into this Artemis program. So definitely check it out. It didn't get a lot of viewership, which kind of bummed me out. And hopefully this one with a nice launch in the middle of it does a little bit better. Thanks again for watching, and we'll catch you on the next one. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters including Gold Level supporters Brian Parker, Chris Allegretta, 
Hot Sauce and Video Games, Logic KGR, Tom Albrecht, and Amda Brown. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.